So yeah, how's your day been? Yeah, delightful, dreamy, perfect. Apart from I've been reported to all the guidelines ever. Who knows? Mm. I'm not sure what that's about. How was yours? Yeah, it was good. Quite busy. Um, I was teaching Sarek to um, one of our dentists. So very educational. Day. Oh, jo- Joe's here. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, man. So we're going to talk some biomimetics. Yeah. Um, what even is biomimetics, man? Um, so biomimetic dentistry, I sort of think we all spend time making dentures look like teeth, composites look like teeth, veneers look like teeth, but we don't really spend a lot of time actually making the internal structure like a tooth. So it's basically a mindset of how you can rebuild a tooth from the outside in to be as strong as possible, but then also you can make it look very nice as well. So it looks nice, function like a tooth, but also structurally, it is as strong as a tooth. So you're less likely to get um, massive fractures, needing root canals and stuff like that. So that's the whole ethos behind it is to structurally rebuild and not just make it pretty. Mm. He said, interesting to say on the root canals there. So I, we'll, we'll cover it on indirects because we're going to chat sort of directs first, then indirects. But do you do, you do posts anymore? Um, no, never really done a post, but <laughs> <laughs> you've been biomimetic from the start. Yeah, I think. Well, I think the first because I never really do full crowns. It was one. It was the first crown prep I did during the T, which was of a premolar, and I did it to like a PFM crown prep, and I literally was like, "Shit, this is like a little tiny stump." Um, and then after that, I was like, this isn't right. I can't do this because the patient never came back for the crown fit. So I don't even know what's going on there. <laughs> but um, that was sort of when I was like, actually, this doesn't make sense. Why am I cutting down a really healthy tooth to a little tiny stump that has actually no strength to it? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's sort of what got me on to this sort of more minimally invasive journey. Um, and then through the joys of Instagram, that's University of Instagram, that's how I found out more about this um, sort of culture, what's the culture, that's the correct word, this ethos, mm-hmm. really, um, and then like the technical aspects of it, um, and yeah, that's what sort of got me on the journey. And now you're doing the, the Aleman yeah, so I, aren't you now? Or have you I'm, finished it now? Yeah, I'm quite sort of good friends with Davy. We're in like a chat group on Instagram, and um, I've always like tried to join on them. I was just missed out, so I wanted to do it during lockdown last year, but I just missed out because mm-hmm. it was full. So then I got on to visit September cohort last year, which was the best cohort, obviously. Um, of course, referred to as the A team. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was September, and it was like every Monday night we would do a lecture and Q and A. Um, and then we did like a case report and stuff at the end, so it was very good. And then there's still like monthly meetings that we do, so it's quite a tight knit community. Mm-hmm. It's good, but actually that wasn't. I first learned about that Matt Najad, you may know off Instagram. He came over at the end of 2019 and um, did like a two day hands on course, um, which was like my first sort of taster on sort of that side of things. Um, but it was good because it's, it's quite funny. You know, you go to all these courses and you sort of meet people and you never really speak to them again. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Loads of people in that course still like message each other all the time. It's a, so it is. It's quite a community feel, which is weird. Mm. Yeah. And then obviously you've well, you've expanded that on and you've got your course as well. It's been a big week, but you've had the BACD announcement all that. <laughs> it's all going on today, isn't it? It's all this week. Um, and that's sort of like, it's almost like a part, part one, part two, isn't it? Posteriors on the course and then anteriors on BACD, is that? Yeah, um, because the the thing about the album course, it's all um, sort of webinars, so it's like really technical, lots of literature, but you sort of, you learn, you, you see how it's done, but you don't really get any like hands-on experience about it, and there's no other courses really that provide the hands-on experience, so that's what we're bringing to the UK. Because yeah, you, you said already the University of Instagram and you see it and you see the preps and you know, you've got the guys over in Australia doing loads of it and you sort of look at these bits and bobs and take it, yeah. take it over and start <laughs> trying things out. And, but yeah, there's nothing sort of really formalizing it apart from the sort of mentorship, I guess, and where you've got manias teachings and things. Yeah. 
Um, so that, I'm, guess, I'm guessing you did lots of manual stuff and follow that. Yeah, I've done like a hands on with DJ as well. That was really good. So I, mm-hmm. I, I've done all the big name stuff, but I'm sort of condensing it down into two days with um, Fran, who did the men, the mastership with me in September. Mm-hmm. She's, mm-hmm. she's very into like she knows all the papers and stuff where I'm not so I'm sort of like I know why I'm doing this but I can tell you the paper and where it's from and uh, so really we should have had Fran on today instead of you yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well when when my uh, when my account gets unbroken we'll get Fran on and we'll, we'll, do, we'll do this properly uh, obviously you can have a bunch of I feel really weird being on the bottom screen it, it's not it doesn't feel right Relegated. um <laughs> Um, so I think we're going to go, we want to go through, people want to go through sort of like, we're going to do direct, posteriors, Franz here as well. Um, so we're going to do direct sort of cases, and then we want to do some indirects, more like split that up into preps and actually like cementation and principles of that. Because you say we're, you're trying to recreate the tooth structure rather than just making it the pre, as you say. Yeah. So how do you want to, do you want to go through a case as we go along or? Um, yeah, so John just got like a, a composite. Go for it. Yeah, we go posterior direct. Okay, let's get a nice one. And the the main thing people were really asking when we put out the question stuff was about uh, materials, choice of bonding agents, two step, one step. Yeah. What the hell's what the hell's ribbond? Um, and APX. I don't know why, but APX composite for some yeah. reason that's all I've seen. It, like, did never heard of it before, and then the last four weeks suddenly everyone's using it. What's that about? <laughs> um, so APX is a composite made by Curaray. You can actually buy it in the UK. So um, I initially got some from the States, which um, Davey Allman posted out. Mm-hmm. Um, or um, German made me aware of this website in Spain. You can get loads of dental stuff really cheap. Um, but they also sell APX. So I managed to get APX um, from there. So I, I, you don't use a lot of it. So it lasts quite a long time. But the main benefit of it is it's got the best modulus of elasticity to match denting mm-hmm. thing on the market. So if you're looking to recreate denting, it's the best thing to use. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the, the key, isn't it? It's you're trying to recreate the various strengths of the enamel, the denting. Yeah. Again, so then you've got optimum sort of bonding, but also the physical properties of it as well. Yeah, because you find, well, we've all seen big amalgams that... Yes, amalgams are really, really strong material. It's not bonded to the tooth, but the tooth can't cope with this, that structure in the middle of it. It's got cracks around, so we don't want that to happen. So what you're trying to do is stitch it, as David always says, like back to front, top to bottom. You're gluing it all together, so it is a tooth again. It's not a tooth with a massive, fun adhesive restoration in the middle. Mm-hmm. That's what we're trying to do. Well, let's let's jump in because that was the thing with your last one. Everyone, everyone loved the cases. So I think let's just jump straight into a. Uh into a case um, do, 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 do. Let's see which one oh you got a selection have we selection yeah <laughs> see if this works Ooh. is that okay so, this is before so we've got um this patient had a comes a restoration which had fallen out um obviously you can see some decay um and there's also some occlusal decay on the seven as well um so i'd isolated with rubber dam so this is like the clamp that I use all the time. I can't remember the name of it, so that's not very helpful for you. But um, <laughs> um, but yeah, isolation. So I use a the majority of the time like a heavy non latex. I think it's the Unident that you get yeah. for dental directory, cheapest chips. Um, but it's really nice to use, um, mm-hmm. and it's quite easy to floss in between. I do really like the. Um, I'm really bad at dental product names. The Rex Nick, Hager. Nick, Nick Tone. Nick Tone. Nick Tone. Really yeah. good, but it's, it's really good for gingival retraction. So if you're doing like anterior work, great. But it's a bit of a nightmare to floss in between teeth. So mm-hmm. this is like my everyday dam. Fine. The everyday dam. <laughs> um, so this is, I had removed the caries. So I've got, had used caries indicator, which we can talk a bit later with a different case. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a nice clean surface um, that we are bonding to. So with bonding to you think about what you're bonding to because it's not just enamel and dentine there's a hierarchy of bondability mm-hmm. and basically what comes wants to do is it wants to bond to the most highly mineralized bit which is enamel 
and it, it will bond to dentin really well and it will bond to dentin better than enamel so you can get like twice the bond strength dentin but you have to be clever about how you do it mm -hmm. so you basically need to trick the composite to stick to the dentin better and that's what <laughs> uh, you heal like ids all these like terms for what you're doing and decoupling with time so that's mm -hmm. what i'm going to try and do so um what i've done is i've beveled the margin so it removes unsupported enamel it increases your bonding error to enamel as well um and prevents you getting that sort of you know, that white line you sometimes get around the edge yeah when you finish your composite so we don't want that to happen um so this is a couple of steps in one but we can go on to the next case which is like individual steps so this is where i've done my immediate dentin sealing um so i use a two bottle system so i either use optibond fl Mm -hmm. which is readily available in the UK or in posteriors I tend to use SC Protect which is a self-etching so that's what SC stands for primer and adhesive then I've resin coated I put my APX and I've got ribbons this bit here and here so this so is my what, what actually is your ribbon that's what people want to what is you know what why are you using ribbon compared to you know a bulk of composite and you know what what are its properties actually you know so um, mean you're using that in this case you can see that so we there's we're talking about the um hierarchy of bondability so what a tooth want, what the composite wants to bond to the most so it wants to bond to enamel the most mm -hmm. um the sort of peripheral denting then the inner denting but then they've also got um carious inner denting which we're not going to remove because we're going to expose if we remove all of that so what we're trying to do is make this area really highly bonded as much as possible before we go on to the next layer before we go on to the next layer so we want to help to protect the bond because if you build up too quickly it, the bond will be seen pull away from the base of your filling and then it's only attached to instead of being attached to if you imagine this was like a cube attached to the four sides in the base it would just be attached to the four sides mm -hmm. and so you're missing out on quite a big chunk of your surface that you could be bonded to. So ribbon act ribbon act or everex acts as a little like stress reducer. So when you build up the layers on top, it sort of allows the composite to slide past it. So you're bonded really well to the dentine, but it sort of prevents it from pulling away from the base. Wow. And I'm sure we've all seen like you've been taking out an old composite, an old like DU or something, and the base of it just flicks out because it was never actually attached. So mm -hmm. the whole point of using the rib bond in the base of your cavity is to make sure that it's really well attached. Because the most likely point that you're going to get leakage in, not so much an occlusal, but from for like a DO, is going to be at the gingival margin. Yeah. So you want to make sure that bit is really well attached. Does that make sense? <laughs> perfect sense, mate. Perfect sense. Uh, maybe we go through this case then, because it's a bit more interesting. Um, so with this case, she, this patient, she was like 15. So you need to be really careful with regards to exposing. So that's why you're following the principles of your caries removal endpoints. Um, so there's a paper by Alman and Manier, which sort of talks through this. Mm -hmm. And basically you want to be doing from your adjacent, so your adjacent tooth is like three millimeters. That's sort of how far you'd want to go in. You wouldn't want to sort of keep going into this area super deep. If you stay within the sort of three millimeters from the adjacent tooth, you can go down as far as you want, basically, because you're never going to hit the nerve. Mm -hmm. And then from your occlusal surface, five millimeters is the max you'd want to go down. So I've gone sort of three millimeters and then five millimeters from the occlusal surface. And we've got a clean peripheral seal zone, which is one of the buzzwords. Mm -hmm. So you've got a two millimeter, at least, margin of sound enamel and dentine around your restoration, which means you've, you're going to have a really high bond strength to this area, so it's not going to leak. Mm -hmm. Makes and what, what are you using <laughs> cavity prep wise? You've said beveling margins. Um, um, so I tend yeah. to just use a either a round burr mm -hmm. um, or like a cylinder. And then I tend to use a rugby ball or a white stone to finish the margin. Probably could have done a little bit more here. But yeah. And then, um, so if you're using a self, this is, gets really technical. If you're using a self etching primer, you're bonding onto the smear layer. Mm -hmm. So you want to be using air abrasion to like compact and push down the smear layer. So then it, you get a bigger bond strength. 
Mm -hmm. It's not so critical to use air abrasion if you're using tutelage, which is Optibond's FL. Mm -hmm. But it's just quite nice just to clean the surface with it. Yeah. Actually, if you air abraded and using tutelage, it actually slightly decreases your bond strength. But you sort of need to weigh up how, if it's a clean surface or there's any bits you want to clean off with the air abrasion. Okay. Um, so if this doesn't make sense, just let me know. So um, this, I have done my immediate denting sealing. So that's with my bonds. So I use SE Protect. Mm -hmm. And SE Protect is really clever because it contains um, something which is going to stop MMPs. So it deactivates MMPs, which are an enzyme, which are in decay, I think. Mm -hmm. And it also disinfects the cavity. So it's killing all the bugs. So and, you're just do, and you're just doing that over as your as you would regular micro brush or that kind of stuff. Yeah, nothing, so, nothing fancy, nothing different. Yeah, nothing fancy. Um, so primary scrub for twenty seconds, air thin, air dry, and then you put the bond on. But you do not air thin bonds because okay. you're increasing the oxygen isn't efficient, and that's so you just put it on. If there's too much, get a dry micro brush and wick it away. Yeah. Um, and then I've done a resin coating on this, so I've used clear fill. Um, again, by Cure, um, which is a very, very highly filled flowable composite. Mm -hmm. So it's got a really high filler content. Um, so that's just a thin layer over the top. And it's really important with SE Protect to do a resin coating because the bond for SE Protect is very thin. So if you haven't resin coated, it doesn't come over the hydrolytic pressure that's coming through dentin tubules. So it basically, you need to resin coat to sort of push the plugs in further into the dentin. Mm -hmm. Sort of weigh them down almost into, yeah. the, into the, yeah. the yeah. So that's all sealed up. So this is if you were doing like an indirect prep, mm -hmm. obviously you'd be on a online prep or whatever. But this is sort of your IDS and resin coating done. Yeah. So then you're you pretty much do your scan or your impression from this. Um, and then this is where the rib on comes in. So a really good trick I learned from my friend Hugh, um, from Ireland. He was in my mastership. He because rib ons is really difficult to move around once it gets wet. So it's like a fiber. Mm -hmm. um, it looks a bit like a drawstring on like um, a hoodie or something, but obviously very thin. And it's once you wet it with resin, it becomes like stiff denim. So it's very difficult to like get into the right place. Mm -hmm. So I put my APX, just a thin layer, and then just sort of pat it in with a micro brush. Then with a little bit of bond on your micro brush, lift up your square of, eight of rib bonds, put it in, and then you wet it with more bond. Mm -hmm. and you sort of pat it into the place and so it wets it so it's all filled with resin um, and then it's sort of patted into place so there's two bits, there's a big square here and there was like a sort of rhomboid shape bit, shaped bit here so I've covered the areas where I had remaining carries to increase mm -hmm. my bond strength so I'm protecting those areas from getting pulled away as I'm layering up so it's almost acting like a buffer between the, the, the base sealed layer and then yeah. the, what you're putting on top. Yeah. And it also with indirect acts as a feel safe because if you fracture your porcelain or whatever, it's going to debond from this area. It's not going to debond from the layer beneath. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you ever if something ever happens to it or it starts to leak, the layer beneath is still so your dentin is still fully sealed up and protected. It would just be yep. the top bit that would come away. Yeah. So you're protecting yourself from catastrophic failures as well. And it's a win-win. Yeah, it's really good with cracks as well because it's a good way to stitch the sides back together and then you're not going to risk the crack sort of just going through the tooth as much. Mm -hmm. Then I've used um, Everex Flow Posterior. Um, Everex Flow, it has little tiny, tiny, tiny fibres in it. Um, and again, it does the same thing as the rib on, so it just helps to relieve stress. But I like using the Everex Flow because the posterior one is really opaque. So it acts as a really good like opaque or to block out any old amalgam staining or any sort of decay, decay that you've left. Um, so actually, when you sort of come to your composite on top, it doesn't look grey mm -hmm. underneath, so it looks quite good. So I've just been, done it in increments, little, sort of around the edges. You want to do like horizontal increments, and then I've just done it sort of built up so you get like a rough fissure pattern of where you're going to put the composite at the end. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then we're do I did cusp about composites. So I use, <clears throat> I really like the ceramics by Densefly Serona mm -hmm. because it's, um, it's really firm, packable composite. I've used like Venus Pearl, Venus Diamonds, Empress, but they all sort of, you'll put like these little grooves and stuff in it, but all just slumps out of the way. Mm -hmm. Whereas ceramics just stays in place. And with biomimetic dentistry, bonding to enamel is like one of the least important bits and your enamel layer is not the most important. So the material that you're using technically isn't the most important because you're focusing on the denting bonding. Because if you actually imagine the amount of enamel I'm bonding to is a very small percentage of the actual cavity size. It doesn't really matter what you're using as long as it's either a composite or um, Emacs. Mm -hmm. There, I've done the rest of my cuss build ups, a little bit of anatomy, so looks quite yeah, nice. You can finish yeah, it there. Yeah, nice. um, I always like to put a little bit of staining in just to be fancy, so I might have overdid it very slightly here. Um, so good, use a little bit of the, I, I should have wicked out a bit more, but um, a little bit of the brown one from Ivy Flower, and mm. then I use a little bit of white just to highlight the top of the cusp and help to blend in around the edges. That's that. From different angles. Check your occlusion. No adjusted need. No adjusting needed. No polishing needed as well. No polishing. So <laughs> at this point, what I would do, I would go around the margin with. Um, I can never remember the name of it. It's from Densefly. Use them to remove attachments. Sometimes. Well, not you don't like the enhanced ones, do you? Yes, that's the enhanced ones. Indeed, that's what I use. So quick run the edge. Check the bite again, make sure the patient's not in the sharp bits with her tongue, and you're done. Mm -hmm. That's insanely nice, man. Great photos as well. Yeah, that's fun to Manesh. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Manesh was on at one point. <laughs> Yuande says Stuart, she agrees. Oh, thanks. Uh, perfect, <laughs> man. So, have you got any, um, if you're, both cases, they're really nice isolation. Any particular tips on that? Heavy dam, obviously. Heavy Top dam. Spacing. Do you use any guides for your? your spacing um, i don't i just wing it but i've been winging it for Legend. so long it's <laughs> <laughs> been winging it for so long it, it, i just sort of know what i need to do um mm. but make sure you've got a sharp punch because you i've got a couple in the practice that just you know they sort of cut halfway through and they end up like hip pulling the little hole out and then it just rips and it's a bit of a nightmare so yeah. a sharp one and be very careful that your the little ring is like fully rotated round. So when you like click it down, you're not going to clash it and blunt it. Mm -hmm. um, then clamps, um, just get some decent clamps. You don't need to have like the full range, just some nice smaller ones. I prefer wingless ones. Mm -hmm. um, so then I use like the parachute technique, which is open the band, you put the hole in, but then you pull it all back and then you just, and then you unravel it all. Um, you can use winged as well, but I find if you're like trying to get matrices and um, sexual matrix bands and stuff around it, it just becomes a bit too much going on. It's a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. We also quite like the Care Soft clumps. They're quite good. Yeah, I like those. I used to use them for everything. I don't really use them anymore because I've got these really um, got some nice black ones that look good in focus. So. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. That's the important thing. So, yeah, I think yeah, you've covered all the material questions that, that people wanted to know. Um, the two step, the two step prime bond, is that just purely from a control point of view? I think you know, strengths are better. Yeah, it's... all the studies show that. But it's it's about um, technique sensitivity, isn't it? So if you use them properly, they're going to be better. But you've got to be, as you say, not air blasting the bond yes. part. It's as well. It's more about the aging of it because using a single bond, single set bond, so like Optimum Solo or I bond or whatever. The long term, after they've been fatigue tested, they they claim to have all these amazing bond strengths, but after fatigue testing, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. So everything degrades over time, but the rate that they degrade is much higher than Optimum Bond FL or SE Protect. Mm -hmm. So those are the two which are described as gold standard in biometric dentistry, and that's the only two that I use. I only ever use Optibon Solo for Invisalign attachments. Okay. Okay, fair enough, man. So, <laughs> want to move on to uh, indirect stuff? Yes. I think you wanted to do it sort of prep-wise, then a like cementation. Um, 
yeah, I think people want to know sort of DME and matrix band. You covered the sort of IDS already a little bit with what you're doing there. Um, I don't know if I've got any photos. I don't have any photos in this um, of DME, but I can have a look in a second. That's all right. Um, so indirect. Oh, this is just another quite good one just to show about Kerry's detector. So I use the Curare one, which is pink. Mm -hmm. You can also get Stable, Sink, Stable Seek, which is like a dark greeny colour, um, which I've used as well. But sometimes if you've got like, are you taking an old amalgam, it just sort of blends into one. You can't really see it as well. Yeah. Um, also, again, this looks quite cool in photos. Yeah, you, can, you, you can't miss that. <laughs> um, so that's when I've done my Kerry's removal. So that's my Kerry's removal endpoint. So I've got my two millimetre clean mm -hmm. peripheral seal zone. So you've got your clean dentine, and then you've got carries, which is left, but it's fine because it's going to be all sealed in. Mm -hmm. And um, something as well as C factor is you need to try and make your preps as wide, sort of widen them out to reduce the C factor. So I've I use like a red flame shaped burr, just to like pull these areas out, or like a, a really coarse disc, just to smooth out the areas. Because if you imagine it was just like this, you've mm -hmm. got a really tight area that you've got a really tight um sort of high c factor so you want to widen out as much as possible to reduce the c factor to reduce your con risk of contracting mm -hmm. and pulling off the walls yeah mixing there we go but yeah indirect indirect here we go so um this patient she came in instead of a chip and filling um and yes she has chipped her filling so it's well observed <laughs> um, but then also the tooth, we've got a crack here, and there was a crack at the front of it as well. And you sort of, it's quite, intraoral photography is really good, so I've got just got like a, one, a USB one, I think, just about, it's just from Amazon. Mm -hmm. The quid's not very, they're sort of like disposable, they break all the time, but they're quite good. And it's a good way of just explaining to the patient why you can't do another filling, because you need to explain, this is really weak, so this side of the tooth isn't some, stick to this side of the tooth you've got a crack here forming already this is going to break off and um, you've got a crack here this is going to break off and you're left with one side of the tooth so if we do just another big filling we need to it's not going to work longer term mm -hmm. i'm going to take a lot of your money for something that i don't think is going to work yeah so i'm not gonna be happy you're not gonna be happy so it's not a good deal for either of us are you seeing more of it as well since covid um, so, so many more cracks Yes, and I see a lot more since I sort of understand why you need to look for them. Yeah. Um, and there is a lot of dentists that sort of just see a big crack. It's like, oh, it will monitor that. But what are you monitoring? You're just monitoring until it cracks in half. And then, mm -hmm. which is quite good if you're an implant dentist, but <laughs> I don't like blood, so I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, yeah, and also magnification so in january i i got some bryant 7.5 loops in the end and you do sometimes regret it because you just spot things that you just wish you didn't see um but yeah definitely good magnification and the light from bryant as well as in seeing um so yeah top tips there um so i've done depth cuts so i've done i think it's a mil just over it's like 1.75 millimeters diameter of the burr so you just measure your burr that you're using so you're sort of aiming for two millimeters of thickness for your emax is what i'm using mm -hmm. um so to some of depth, depth cuts so i know how far to prep so you're removing enough to add strength to the tooth but you're not moving too much so that you're just basically doing a crown prep and the reason we want to try and maintain as much of this tooth as possible is there's nothing wrong with this bit of the tooth why drill it away and you need to think when you're doing a crown i always think of it like an apple so if you have an apple in your hand, you're not going to be able to crush the whole apple. But if you eat all the apple and you're just left with the core, it's so easy just to break it in half. And it's the same principle with the crown. So if you drill all the enamel away, you're just left with this little tiny stump. And the main reason, the main area a crown fractures is at the side where it just splits in half. Or you end up getting a massive abfraction cavity underneath it and you get recurrent decay. So we want to try and keep this area around the um, CEJ intact because once it's removed, the tooth's really, really weak. Mm -hmm. So basically that's me removed the composite. I've tied up the margin. 
and the cracks i've investigated the cracks so you want to it's okay to leave this because it's within a crack within enamel is described as biomimetic so it's a normal thing to have in a tooth mm. but a crack into dentine is bad because it's going to keep spreading and it's a bit like if you get a crack in your wall, you don't just put polyfill over the top because you've got a big substantial crack underneath that's so going to like break in half. So you want to basically remove the crack into dentine. So you basically drill down, but you're thinking of the principles sort of three millimeters. Mm -hmm. You don't want to, if it was in here, I wouldn't go chasing it. You want to basically just stop it where it's starting and then you can sort of stitch it back together with some fiber. I think there was a little crack around here and a little crack at the front. Mm -hmm. You can see there's a little crack there, but that's within the enamel. So that's fine. That's chill then i've used my caries detector so you can see there is some caries left here but i've got a clean peripheral seal zone so i'm not worried about that mm -hmm. any questions i'm good um so what i've done is my immediate dentine sealing so i've used sc protect mm -hmm. scrub it on for 20 seconds and SC Protect is good because it is less technique sensitive because you can scrub it on for a minute, you can scrub it on for 20 seconds, it doesn't make any difference. It's not like a total etch where if you over etch, it's really bad because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very weak acid, so it's not going to keep going and going and going. It will just do as much as it will and then that's it, it'll stop. Mm -hmm. So scrub for 20 seconds, air dry 10 seconds. Then I've used SC Protect Bottle 2, Light Cure, and then I've used FL Bottle 2 over the top and as your resin coat <laughs> yeah so ethyl yeah. bottle, bottle two is basically like a really highly filled very flowable flowable composite mm -hmm. and it's so when you if you've got a flow with a little syringe it's a bit you have to dab it and like wipe it around dab it and right wipe it around it's a bit of a faff but if you just use bottle two of ethyl it's very easy to just wipe it all over with a micro brush mm -hmm. um so here i've used some in the smaller cracks, it can be sometimes quite tricky to get um, the rib bond in. So down here at the back, I've just used a little bit of um, Everex Flow. But on the sort of larger crack here, I've put some APX into the crack. And then I've done a small sort of square there of rib bonds, mm -hmm. packed it in. And then I've done a larger bit. So this is to stitch this crack area back together. And then I've put a larger bit of rib bond over the area with decay. And this is again to help to protect or dentin bonds. Mm -hmm. Then I've basically gone over the top with the flowable composite and that's just to sort of seal it up because sometimes these areas can be a little bit rough and then if you're taking a scan or an impression it becomes a bit of a, doesn't look so nice. So just sort of smooth mm -hmm. it over a little bit of flowable composite um, and then I just re sort of prep the margin. So I just use like a fine red straight burr without mm -hmm. any water and just go around it just to sort of tidy everything up. Um, and then my favorite instrument, which I think everyone should use, is a hand scaler. So I use the pink LMART. And I just always go around, even with composites, with your prep, just go around the margins and just chip off any little bits of enamel. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all super clean. It looks nice. And then scan and done. Yes. Yeah, so, um, and that's pretty much, that's just a nice video. Do, do, do. So when you've done the flow after, is that the Everex that you've done it after you've done the rebond? I did clear fill. Mm -hmm. So you're meant to seal fibres in. You don't want to have fibres, like furry fibres going around the place. So you want to seal them in. Fine. So I just use like a normal flowable, which is the clear fill one, which is the one that's recommended. We just had a question pop up about uh, how are you temporising these non-retentive preps and amazing photos, by the way? So majority of the time I use Cerex, so there's no temporary. But that helps, yeah. <laughs> it does help. Um, but if I do do lab ones as well, so what you would do is really important loads and loads of glycerin and light cure because you want to stop your temporary from sticking onto it. Because if you don't do that, you're going to have to re prep your temporary and start mm -hmm. from scratch. So loads and loads of glycerin. Um, and then you can either just do clip or something or composite, or if you've got like lots of temp over the top, if you've made a stent. Mm -hmm. and then you t I tend to use um, just like some flowable and just get it into it. So attach the temporary onto the undercuts. So you can still get a TP brush in between, but you won't be able to floss, but you're just sort of locking it in. But the beauty of doing this is because you've sealed up the dentine, no bacteria is going to get in because it's completely sterile because it's been done on a rubber dam. 
um, you've sealed up with your resin coats and your IDS. And it then means if your temporary does come off or it's a bit loose, it's not the end of the world because it's not going to be sensitive or give you any problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what I tend to do with temporaries. Um, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, with Serac though, it does, it's not the most aesthetic um, mm -hmm. case. So we wanted to discuss why you want to cement with heated composite. So I've got a nice yeah. indirect case. Um, basically on the math ship, I find that, you know, when you do all these courses, everyone tells you etch for so long, etch for so long, and you sort of end up doing this weird pick and mix of why you're doing everything. Mm -hmm. So I understand why you sh how you should be preparing your indirect composites or your indirect ceramics. And once you've done, let's see, this part, you're, what you're going to replace it with isn't really the be all and end all. So Emacs is good because it's similar to enamel and characteristics wise, but you could also do an indirect composite and it will work just as well. Just had someone a little bit late to the party just asking, what do you use to seal the dentine? So I use my two step um, bonds and then I resin coat with a flowable, I use clearfill flowable. Cool. Um, yeah. So, fit, so day of fit or afternoon fit. of fit with your syrup? So afternoon of fit. So I try in, so from the lab, you try in. And I just try, I don't have the rubber dam on when I try and I want to see all the margins, I want to see it's all okay. Mm -hmm. And then once I've done that, sit the patient up and I'm like, I'm going to be five minutes chill. So I've got ceramic etch, 9.6%. You want to place it on your Emacs for one minute. Mm -hmm. If you're using feldspathic porcelain, it's um, one and a half minutes. Let's put it on, rinse it really well. But when this acid is on the ceramic, it produces salts, which you want to remove because it can affect your bond. So then you just use normal mm -hmm. um, normal etch and you scrub that in for three minutes. You can also put it in an ultrasonic bath as well, which is the same thing. Um, so then rinse and dry silane. And with silane, you want to heat it up to remove because silane, when it's like basically sets, it releases water. Put back. Um, you don't want to have any water. So what I tend to do is once I run the silane, I put it on my Bryant um, composite heater and it like heats it up as well and then after it's the silane. And with silane you want to you only want one thin layer of it, you don't want a thick layer of it. So when you air thin it, you basically start on one side and you basically blow all the excess off. You don't want to be pushed blowing down and blowing the silane and you want to remove all the excess to the side. Um, rubber dam um, and with your prep you want to air braid just to tidy it all up um, and then your denting's all sealed up but you want to etch the enamel so you this is all sealed up with composite but to freshen up you air braid it then you just etch the whole prep rinse dry then use optimal and FL bottle 2 as your bonds Pins mm -hmm. it over the top, but do not like your, or else it's not going to fit. Then I use Optibond FL on the fit surface of your online. And then I use heated composites and I use Empress Direct. Mm -hmm. So it's the benefits of heated composite are that it's not like a dual cure. You're not like quickly rushing around to remove all the excess before it starts to set. Mm -hmm. You got loads of time so you press it down remove a bit of the excess get it all nice and clean then i always like press it on a couple of times more because and rock like so press on and rock it side to side just to keep pushing any excess out and mm -hmm. um, then i get my nurse with like a what's those round amalgam plugging instruments so, like, burnisher. burnisher just to push down in the top and then i floss in between i always find my nurses are a bit mean because they push down really hard so then you've got a little bit more excess to remove. <laughs> I haven't done amalgam for a while, didn't know what no. the was, yeah. <laughs> Amalgam free dentistry. Um, <laughs> and then basically once you're happy, you just like your, and then um, 20 to 30 seconds from each surface. Um, and then there will always be, so when you're removing the fine little bit, if you've got like a micro brush and you're sort of 
pass it away and pass it down, it means there's always like a tiny bit of extra composite, which you can then polish in. So you've got a really nice smooth transition from the tooth into the ceramic work. Mm -hmm. So it looks a lot better. So you can start to get invisible. So that's just, that's Rich Art, my lab technician. Yeah. He's very good. Um, but you so, can see uh, how... I think the thing with the with the heated composite, as you said it there, you put you're putting your um, your onlet onto into the heat into heat as well. Because obviously, if you've heated the composite, but then you've left the onlet on the side, it's going to cool. Yeah, and it just sort of firms super up really quickly. quickly. Whereas, yeah. so I like Empress Direct enamel, and I always use A3. Um, mm -hmm. It's such a thin layer, but it's just polishes really well and that's the main benefit of using a composite rather than like Reliax or whatever because it's designed to be polishable and to look good mm -hmm. whereas a cement is designed to basically cement. an efficient way to do it but not to look good so you find that over time you get much less marginal staining with heated composite mm -hmm. yeah so that's a nice little online there and then we're back to that one that's that one perfect I think that Makes total sense. I don't know if anyone's got any composite, uh, any questions there about any of the bits. Um, how's the response been with, with the course? I know Fran's been on, Fran was down there, but sounds good. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, loads of um, interest. We've got loads of bookings. Booking up very fast if you want to book in. <laughs> Anyone, please? <laughs> have, you got, have, you got, have you got any spots left? Um, yeah, there's a couple of spots left. Um, oh, there we go. So, um, I think we're down to the last couple of spots left, so book on fast. Um, oh, 6th and 7th of August. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing it slightly differently because, do you know when you go to these, you sort, we sort of wanted the hands-on to be really just doing lots of hands-on. Mm -hmm. So we're planning to do a couple of webinars before where we sort of go into rubber dam because you can never really do rubber dam hands-on unless you've got a live patient. Mm -hmm. So we're going like, to do the rubber dam before, do a lecture on that, and then you can actually start to do rubber dam your patients straight away. Um, caries detector it's unless you've got a caries tooth you can't really use it so mm -hmm. again we're going to do that and then we're going to go through a lot of the literature behind it and why you're doing this and so you've got all the knowledge and Fran's can... doing that bit right? Sorry? Fran's doing that bit with yeah, the that's it. it's not the back <laughs> <laughs> um, you're going for a coffee at that point yeah. <laughs> um, and then the hands-on is just going to be just sort of a quick summary of everything and then just hands-on because we're going to cover posteriors, um, indirect and direct, how to make things look nice as well. So we're going to go into like tints and stains and stuff because there's not many sort of courses that really cover, everyone sort of forgets about posterior composites, but that's everyone's bread and butter mm -hmm, mm -hmm. stuff. So, and I find with my because I sort of mess around with tints and stains and posterior teeth where no one can see it and it's not really the end of the world, but it looks rubbish. But yeah. then when you come to use it on an anterior tooth, you sort of know, oh yeah, they need to be a bit careful using this colour because it is a bit mental. Yeah. Yeah, you know how to handle it. Um, Gary just asked a good question. Um, do you mix both clear fill and Optibond FL systems? Well, you sort of said the bit there, you sort of used yeah. the SSE and then almost as the resin. Yeah. Use the so Optibond. You can... There's, um, so the guy that basically helped to develop, well, developed Everex, he uses it on SE. He's doing a study on SE bottle one with FL bottle two currently. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, it probably works, but I'm not risking it right now. So I use SE protect one and two, and then I use FL bottle two as your resin coat. As I said earlier, it's easier to apply it on a micro brush rather than sort of flap around with a syringe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I hope that answers it for you, Gary. Yeah, Matt, the, I mean, the course sounds really interesting with like doing that pre webinar bit beforehand because I think it's um, a lot, obviously, a lot of courses have started to do you know the, the, the main ones that are running all the time. You know, I think IAS Academy, like TIFFs, they're doing that. Yeah. And I found actually that it's been really popular having this pre webinar bit. And I think they're saying that they're going to do that all the time now. That's going to be the new way that the course is going to run having that. I think as well because it's a lot to you know you go to these courses and you have like 500 cups of coffee and you're like dead so yeah, yeah, yeah. like the, 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 the last day you just you don't really can't take anything more in so if we're trying to sort of give any like little bite-sized chunks and then it's sort of just putting on the practice rather than just throwing all out for you in two days 
I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. It's going to be good. Perfect. But well, sorry you've had to do it on yours. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to get on the, on the blower to Instagram and see what's going on. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got any other questions, but that was really good, man. The cases, as always, were on point. Um, Thank you. I would, say, I would say cheers for coming on, but cheers for inviting me on. Yep. <laughs> I'll see, um, see what we've got next week on. Yeah, what see what we've got next week. I, I don't think we've got anything on next week, but it looks good. It's only called live. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good stuff. I'm going to have to leave first because it's not even mine, is it? <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Cheers, cool. man. Have a good evening. You too. Thanks.